guys on for your conference call. I hope y'all are doing well. It's Tuesday morning. Morning, everybody logging in via Periscope. Good morning. Good morning, Tanya. Good morning. Good morning, guys. That's Korean fast. Here we go. Morning. Come on in the room. Come on in. Come on in. Hope y'all are doing well this morning. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. You all know the drill. Good morning. Uh, come on in. Uh, invite your followers as you walk in. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, all right, as you're inviting your followers and you're coming in, shoot me your location. Where are you? Where are you? Rehearse. I'm going to talk about that too. Uh, send, send me your location, um, where, where you're at, Texas, New Jersey, of course, H ATL, come on, where, oh my goodness, Macon, Georgia, Tucson, Charlotte, Columbia, Lawrence, come on, all right. Kansas City, Missouri. Jacksonville. Wow. I mean, Dallas, y'all a little bit everywhere. All right. Good morning. Y'all literally a little bit, a little bit of everywhere. Queens, New York. Well, I'm so glad and so honored to have you all on with us, Washington State. Jesus. All right. So glad, so honored to uh, have you guys on this morning. It is early for some of you all. Washington State, Arizona, I know it's really early. Um, so, but so honored to have you all on with us. Listen, I, I posted a little clip last night. I'm so, oh, free conference call line, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to keep from pressing stuff. All right, I think I got it now. All right. Uh, Last night's rehearsal was just absolutely bananas. It was very um, uh, powerful, just a preparation. <laughs> uh, and I just, I can't wait to loose these Levites and let them do what God has called them to do um, from a music perspective. It was very, uh, very, very powerful. Uh, it's kind of what I think the reason God is tying these, these pieces in this morning. Uh, so I'm going to try to make it all make sense. I thank God for the Tarver family, family and for them investing in what we're becoming. And they're going to be back, I promise you that much. Um, going to be back, and I think they're a valuable, uh, valuable gift to what we're doing right now. All right, uh, morning, Jaleesa. All right, so let's pray, and I'm going to tie it all together and going to make it all make sense, I hope. I pray um, uh, to... Uh, what God is doing and where we're going and how we're going to make all that a reality. All right. So, Lord, I honor you and I thank you for your sons and daughters and for all that you're doing in our lives collectively, all that you're desiring to bring to reality and how you're doing the thing. We honor you for choosing us at such a time as this to be the carriers of your glory and to be the dispensers of everything that you have called us to be. Now this morning, I'm asking for your wisdom and for your grace, asking for your strength and for your anointing. I'm asking that you uh, show yourself strong in all that we are and all that we're becoming. And I want you, I ask you uh, to teach us how to war appropriately. Never let us be so frustrated with a season or a situation that we forget the necessity and the principle that comes first in war and that's worship. So I pray uh, that in everything that is transpiring in our hearts and our lives and everything that you're doing, you give us heaven strategies for our situations and you teach us how to do a thing appropriately as it pertains to your will and your kingdom. We love you for just uh, choosing us for such a time as this and for giving us the grace to go after a thing and to become what you are calling us to be in the season. And for many, they have made sacrifices 
um, every morning to be online, 6 a.m., some 3 a.m., and a variety of different times. This morning, I'm asking you to honor their sacrifice, honor everything that they have sown in order to be a part of what you're becoming. And don't let this sacrifice be in vain. Holy Spirit, I pray this morning that you download divinely what each person needs in order to get to their next. I pray that you give them uh, their wisdom, uh, open their hearts, and allow them to receive freely of what you're trying to do in them. And we love you uh, for your strength, for your power, for your oil, for your anointing, and everything that you're doing. You honor sacrifice and you honor discipline. And for many, this has been the most disciplined they've been able to be in a very long time. Honor the sacrifice and let uh, your will be revealed in their hearts uh, because they have set their hearts and minds to seeking you early in the morning. Make what they are praying for and what they need become a reality. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, this morning, yesterday morning, uh, I talked about the concept of a mighty warrior. Uh, I've talked about it from the hand and from the perspective of Gideon. I love the story of Gideon. Not many stories in the Bible that I don't just love, but I love, I mean, I, I just love the word. Um, but I in particular love that story of Gideon um, because it talks about something that uh, many of us do not prefer to deal with or prefer to have to handle or manage. And that's cutback. That is losing something. Um, that is um, losing something that we feel like we want, desire, and or need. And Gideon was willing and able and, and really positioned his heart uh, to not be afraid to lose something that he felt like was valuable. Um, this morning, I want to um, talk about that same concept of war uh, and warriors, and I want to take it from another extension, and I want to extend it from from this uh, from this perspective um, that God will teach you the art of war and the art of being a warrior from your posture of worship. All right, from your posture of worship. Here's really where I want to start this morning. I believe that many of us have found ourselves fighting battles unnecessarily that we were not designed nor heaven ever desired for us to fight. We have found ourselves in a position where we have felt like we've had to defend ourselves, uh, defend our name, defend our character, defend our integrity, defend who we are, and we have uh, discovered ways to get in ourselves in order to get in ourself in order to make that happen. Um, and the thing that God began to deal with me about even last night as we were sitting in uh, worship preparation, and I'm listening to these singers and to the teaching, the thing that God began to deal with me about was when our hearts are postured correctly towards him, there are uh, aspects and avenues of our lives that we never even have to respond to. He'll go to war for us when we let him. And very often, we misappropriate our energy and our strength and our wisdom trying to find a thing in our flesh. And what makes us weary is we forget that God never designed us to fight some stuff on our own. Matter of fact, God didn't design us to fight anything on our own. But there's some battles we have engaged in that we never belonged in. There has been some things and some avenues of war and warring that we never should have put our hands to to begin with. The truth of it is, our worship has the ability to fend some stuff off in a way that nothing else can. Something happens when we settle in our minds to posture our heart to seek God in the midst of criticism, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of frustration, in the midst of everything and anything else that can happen. Something powerful happens when we set our hearts and set the posture of our hearts to seek God in the midst of a thing. It is very easy 
to get distracted by what we see, what we feel like we're facing, how we feel like we got to defend ourselves, how nobody's in our corner, how all of these things are happening. Good morning, BT. All these things are happening to us. They're happening through us. Uh, and we very often forget that when we posture our heart to seek God, God can do a thing that can't nobody else do. And we don't have to fight for ourselves. We don't have to war for ourselves. We don't have to try to position our hearts to make a thing happen. God will do in a moment what you would have tried to do in your flesh for a lifetime that has frustrated you, that has had you wondering if God is there, how God is going to show up, how he's going to make it happen. When we posture our hearts to say, God, no matter what I'm facing and no matter what it looks like, if I seek your face, I'm going to find you every single time. I'm praying for you this morning that God will give you a revelation that your worship has a way of attracting him and the attraction of him is going to fend off some enemies that you never needed and that you didn't even know you were fighting and it's going to make some stuff that you've been warring against in your mind and your heart for years and decades. It's going to make it all go away. I'm telling you that if you make up in your mind that if you are going to seek God above and beyond anything else, that God is going to be the center of your attention. I promise you, the presence of God is going to make some stuff leave that don't belong. Now, Here's the thing. When God shows up, it is nearly impossible for anything that does not belong to reside. Wherever God chooses to abide, there's something that happens that causes um, warfare that you have found yourself in to not feel as intense, to find frustration that you have felt on your job, in your family, in your marriage. It is hard for you to stay mad and frustrated frustrated when your heart is really in a posture of worship because what worship does is it turns your attention back to the place back to the person that it, your life really should be centered on and when your attention is turned back to the one who deserves all of your attention anyway he has a way of drowning out worries that should have never came he has a way of silencing voices that should have never been in your ear he has a way of causing you to rise above adversity that should have never got you down. I'm telling you, worship does a thing that can nothing else do. Worship does something in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit. It does something in your soul that captivates you in such a way that it brings you back to the place where you say, you know what? I don't care what it feels like. God is the object of my affection. I want him more than I want anything else. And if I get him, he'll drown everything else out. This morning, I want to silence the voice and the voices that keep trying to frustrate your future, frustrate your destiny, that keep trying to put you in a place where you don't know what your next step looks like, where you're wondering if God is for you. I tell you, this is one way you find out if God is for you. See what happens when you start to worship. And if God's presence and power re is revealed in the midst of it, God will give you a strategy. He'll give you some insight. He'll give you some strength. Very often when we don't feel like God is for us and when we are in our feelings about a moment and or a situation, it is because we have become overly consumed with a thing that we should have never touched. We have allowed a thing, a concept, an idea to become our lifeline instead of understanding that in God we got everything that we need. And in God, he sends for us everything that we desire and everything that he has created for us to become who he's called us to be. So this morning, I want your heart's posture to be returned to a place where you say, God, it don't have to feel good for me to say, I'm still going to worship you. It ain't got to make no sense. I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to know everything. All I got to know is you are God and early in the morning will I seek you. I'll seek your face and not your hand. I will want what you provide for me as a means or as a byproduct of what 
worship. And I will not be overly consumed with what I've been consuming. I will turn my heart and my attention and my affection back to you. Because I'm telling you, if there's anything that God is attracted to in you and for you, it's your worship. God loves to hear the sound. He loves to hear the heart. He loves to hear the worshipers. It's something the Bible says that if you seek me, all right, if you seek me, the Lord is seeking such to worship him. He is looking for people that will make a conscious decision that I don't care what it feels like. I don't care what my circumstance has been. I don't care what they thought about me. I don't care how bad it's been. When I make up my mind to seek the face of the Lord, the Lord will come rushing in like a mighty wind and bring clarity to everything I'm dealing with. I'm telling you, what God is trying to get you to a place is understanding that if you worship me, I'll make your next step clearer than it's ever been before. I will give you an understand, understanding that you did not have. I will give you a strength that your destiny demands. I will give you an insight and a wisdom and a revelation that when you draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. And when I draw close to you, I never come empty handed. I've come with everything heaven provides for your next step. And it's something about drawing into the presence of God that makes you forget about the stuff that really don't matter anyway. I'm telling you, heaven is demanding for your worship to draw closer. And you want to talk about war. You want to talk about warring. You want to talk about spiritual warfare. I'm telling you, worship gives you a strategy for everything that your life needs. And if you find your place, yourself in a place of worship, God is going to give you an insight. He's going to give you a revelation. And he's going to give you a strength that you did not have before. I'm not saying that your enemies are not real. I'm saying they don't matter. I'm not saying that you really don't have things going on in your life. I'm saying they really don't matter. I'm telling you that worship will give you a perspective that says I may be in it, but it ain't about to happen to me. It's about to happen for me. Now, God will give you a revelation in worship that can't nothing happen to you that heaven did design, but God will make a thing happen for you to make it work for your good and for his glory. And what you feel like the enemy sent to destroy you, to frustrate you, to crush you, to crush you, to distract you. Your worship is going to show you that in the midst of a thing, I am God. I'll stand up and show myself strong. I'll give you a wisdom and a strategy that you didn't know you needed. I'll give you something that only heaven can provide, but it only happens from the posture of worship. Now, I, I'm, I'm saying all this, and I'm setting it up because I'm still piggybacking off of Gideon understanding who he was and Gideon really getting a revelation, I'm not, but I'm not dealing with Judges 6. I'm going to go somewhere else this morning. Gideon really getting a revelation of who he was as a mighty warrior. He didn't get that revelation of how strong he was until he got in the presence of God. He did not get an understanding that he was a mighty warrior. And as a matter of fact, he had been called by the right name his entire life as a warrior, his entire life. He didn't get that revelation till he got in a place where God began to reveal a thing to him. It did not happen until he found himself in the presence of God. I'm telling you, you're identity crisis is crushed when you come into God's presence. God has a way of revealing a thing, of showing you a thing, of giving you an understanding of who you are in spite of what people have called you, what they have thought about you, what they have said about you. The presence of God will give you a revelation that your destiny demands, and you can't move forward without a revelation of who God has created you to be. And I'm telling you, part of your holdup has been the need for God to crush some of the crises in your identity, to give you an understanding, to give you a revelation, to give you a strength that you didn't know you needed, that all this only happens in his presence. If you draw close to God, God will begin to show you the real you. He'll show you the you that he's trying to kill, and he'll show you the you that he's trying to revive. He'll show you the you that needs him, and he'll show you the you that he don't need at all. He'll show you the you of your past. He'll show you the you of your present. 
He'll show you the you of your future. He'll show you where he's trying to take you and how he's going to get you there. But it only happens in his presence. Worship has a way of attracting God to show you an aspect of what you're becoming that you have yet to see. And I'm crazy enough to believe that you have yet to see the fullness of everything that heaven has demanded and will supply for your life. You are only on the outskirts or on the cusp of seeing the fullness of what heaven has designed and what your destiny demands. I'm telling you right now, if you're listening in on the scope, you have not walked in the fullness of everything that God is creating you for and what he's calling you to. Some of you, God has been dealing with you about transition, what transition looks like, how a new space is going to give you a new grace, and how you've tried to deny it in your heart because it's hard for you to see yourself in a place outside of where you've been. I'm telling you, in worship, God's going to give you a revelation that your next needs, and he's going to tell you how he's going to make it happen. He's going to tell you how he's going to make it a reality. Some of you have been denying the call of God in this season in and over your life to do a thing that didn't make any sense to you. And I'm telling you, in worship, God is going to prove to you that if you simply submit to my will, I'm going to show you a thing in a way that you've never seen it before. I am showing you a way to construct the thing that has not been seen in the earth outside of you releasing it the way that I'm telling you to do it. I'm telling you how to build a thing. I'm telling you how to build a people. I'm telling you how to build a vision. I'm telling you how to incline your ear to me. They hear heaven's secrets in a way that earth needs and must become a reality, but it's only going to happen when you submit. I'm telling you this morning that if you posture your heart to submit yourself to God, God is going to give you a strategy and worship that your destiny needs. And in this, now I'm going to my, I'm going to the story I'm dealing with this morning. This is all preliminary stuff, but I'm telling you, if you can get over the fact that you're going to have enemies, you're going to have detractors, you're going to have critics, you have people that don't understand. You got people that think you're crazy. You're going to have people that do not believe in you or your why behind doing it. I've had people in this season say, you know what? God has called me to pick up and to move and he's called me to be here or to be there. But, and I know that there's a reason, even though I don't understand it, it don't make no sense. And I'm telling you, if you're crazy enough through what God has revealed to you in worship to do the thing that don't make no sense right now, God is going to give you, I'm telling you, he's going to open up something that you would have never given got no matter how long you work for it. If you would just do the thing that don't make any sense to anybody else, that don't make any sense to it, it conceptually, uh, conceptually, it don't make no sense to you. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. If you'll be willing to do the thing that don't make sense to anybody else, but it has made sense to heaven, if you do a thing the way God told you to do it and follow heaven's blueprints for it to happen, God has a way of opening up a door that you would have prayed for, that you have asked him for, and he will give you a strategy on the other side of it. I'm telling you, worship opens up things and gives you a means of access to God that you can't have outside of it. But here it is. You don't do, you don't participate in it to get something from God. You participate in it because you know when you touch heaven, you are positioning your heart to see the fullness of what God designed. I'm telling you how worship, we can never use worship as a tool of manipulation to cause God to give us something. On the contrary, we use worship as our tool of accessing heaven to say, I need or I desire God so much that I don't care what it costs me. I'll lose everything just to get to where he is. Now, I never want us to be positioned where we use worship as a tool to manipulate the hand of God. If you're using worship as a tool of apology, or as a tool of manipulation. It can never do what it was created to do. Worship can't be used to make God do a thing. In all actuality, what worship does is it repostures and repositions your heart to receive whatever it is God has desired and heaven is demanding for this season of your life. Worship causes your flesh to die in such a way that heaven can be revealed in the midst of it. You cannot use worship to say, God, 
Father, I need you to move or I need you to do this for me. And so I'm going to worship you a little bit. And I believe if I stroke your ego, it's going to be something that causes me to get what I need. If you're only using worship as a tool to stroke the ego of God, you've already missed the entire purpose of it anyway. Worship was revealed to us that we would have a level of access to heaven that we never had before. When Jesus died, I'm telling you, and I don't even know why I'm going all the way over here. I'm, I'm going to deal with warrior worship in a moment. But when Jesus died, something powerful happened. When Jesus died, we all talk about the dead getting up out the grave. We talk about him giving up the ghost. We talk about him submitting his life to death. But I believe one of the most powerful things that happen in the earth from a revelatory perspective is the veil of the temple was rent or torn from the top to the bottom. What that symbolized was a new level of access in the earth for those that would come come after God, that now there was no need to go to another to get to his presence. Literally, heaven ripped the veil from the top to the bottom. It was not ripped from the bottom to the top because that would have symbolized something a man could have made happen. The veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. It was torn from the top to the bottom to reveal a level of glory and a level of access that those of us who would go after God would have. And it only happens when our heart is postured appropriately in worship. And when you make up your, your mind to go after God more than you go after anything else, God will give you an understanding and revelation. I'll go even further. God will send the right voice to confirm what he's doing. Here's where I'm trying to go this morning. Second Chronicles 20 reveals to us and I've dealt with this before, and I want to kind of, mm, I want to poke and prod at it in a different way this morning. Second Chronicles 20 deals with Jehoshaphat. It deals with Jehoshaphat in a time of frustration because he's having to go to war against uh, five kings in all actuality. He's dealing with, with war against five kings. They have surrounded Israel. They are trying to bring their demise. Jehoshaphat don't have a clue of what to do. He don't know what's coming next. He is frustrated in the moment. He does not have an, a small, even the smallest indication of what the next season looks like. But look at what God begins to do in a thing. When he calls all the people together and he tells everybody, we're going to pray and seek the face of God, God begins to send an answer. And I cannot say this enough. When you posture your heart in the midst of what you're feeling, in the midst of what you're facing, to say, God, I'm still going seek your face. It does not matter how it feels. It does not matter about my perception. It does not matter about what I see. Here is what God is calling me to say this morning. You can't be a warrior always on your emotional roller coaster and in your feelings and unstable. The thing about a warrior in worship is identity. When you know who you are, you are not moved and or swayed very easily by uh, what you see. What you see does not move or shift who you are and who God has called you to be. There is some, there is a revelation that transpires in worship that keeps you from being moved by everything that you feel and that you see. I'm telling you, God cannot use you at your best if your feelings are always going to dictate your next move. If the way that you feel is going to speak uh, to what your next movement is as it pertains to God, you will always miss the will of God. If you are moved by a thing that in your eyes don't make no sense, you'll always miss the hand of God. You got to learn. We have to learn how to regulate our emotions. And I'm, when I say this, I mean, I mean it from this perspective. If your emotions are the driving force behind every decision you're going to make, you'll always miss God's hand. You'll always miss his heart because God will bypass your emotions to download something to your spirit that moves you out of your emotional place and gets you to a place where you can see God from an entirely different perspective. This is what the fruit of 
the spirit brings about a thing called controlling ourself or bringing about self-control in us. It means that we don't allow what we feel to dictate what God is trying to do. We don't allow what we see, what we feel, how bad it feels, how it don't make no sense to us. We don't let that be the thing that dictates our submission to worshiping God in the midst of a thing. And I'm telling you, I don't want you to be moved at, in a place uh, by your emotions. I don't want the frustration of what could be and how people won't understand you and how people won't like it and how you don't know how it's going to work out. Listen, uh, nine times out of ten, we don't have a clue of how it's going to work out when we're walking in destiny and what heaven is demanding. It didn't have to make a lick of sense to us. God will call us to do a thing that don't make no sense sense. He'll call us to do a thing that we can't even add up together to make make sense. God will call us to make a seasonal sacrifice that don't nobody else understand to get us to a place called destiny. Because when Jehoshaphat, and I'm going to make, again, I want you to just read through Second Chronicles 20. When Jehoshaphat calls, uh, finds out that the kings are about to attack him, the first thing that he does it's he does not get in a position to say we need all of our warriors to be ready to fight. We need to get everybody in our war position. We we need to, you know, everybody get a sword and a spear, get your armor. He, he doesn't tell everybody to do what most would do in a moment where their lives are literally about to be lost because they're surrounded by the enemy. What he does is he does not allow the distraction of what he is to cause him to remove the posture that God is calling him to be in. What he does, he says, listen, hey guys, uh, let's, let's, let's fast. Now, let's pray. Let's see what the hand of God is saying. I don't know what the answer is, and I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't have a clue of what God is doing. But I do know this, that if we seek his face, if we turn to fasting, and we put our face to the wall, and if we seek God, he's going to give us a revelation of what we need for our next. I'm telling you, <laughs> you want people around you that don't mind hitting their face to say, we, we don't know the answer, but we know who does. And we're going to call a fast. We're going to call a time of court for prayer because we need a level of insight that the earth does not have yet. And when you make up your mind to get heaven's insight as it pertains to your situation, God will do something in you and he'll do a thing that would not have been done had you tried to do it in your own power. I'm telling you this morning, God will give you an ability in prayer and fasting and seeking his face and worship and listen, this is what Jehoshaphat did in the midst of a fast, in the midst of prayer that changed everything concerning the trajectory of where they were going. Jehoshaphat turns his face to God. They began to cry out. They began to call God on his record and his history. But something powerful happened in that 12th or 13th verse. Jehoshaphat says this, we don't know what's ahead we don't know what's about to happen. We don't know how it feels, but this is what we do know. Our hope and our trust is in you. Everything shifts when you know who to put your eyes on in the midst of your situation. Everything changes when you know that you ain't got an answer. You don't have a clue. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what God is doing. Your heart has been broken. You ain't got no insight. You have no revelation. You have used all your strength. You're depleted in every aspect, but you hit your face to say, God, I don't know the answer, but our hope and our trust is in you. Our eyes are fixed on you. We believe that you're about to do a thing in us and we ain't got no clue of how it's going to happen. But we trust and believe the God of the Bible. I love it that way. We trust and believe the God of our ancestors. We trust and believe the God that has done it more than once and he's going to do it again. We trust and believe that if you are God, you're going to do what you promised. You're going to do a thing in us that we could not have done 
in our own strength and our own power. And out of that, a young prophet rises up by the name of Jehaziel and tells them, listen, I don't care what you're feeling. This battle don't belong to you. This battle is the Lord's. The warrior Jehaziel, a young teenager, rises up out of the tribe of Judah to simply say, y'all, I know how it feels and I know it don't make no sense. But I'm telling you, this battle don't belong to you. It belongs to the Lord. He tells them God's about to do a thing that don't make no sense. All you got to do is show up. And let me tell you something. When they got this revelation, this is what set the trajectory for them to be worshiping warriors. They get the revelation from Jehaziel and Jehoshaphat don't say, hallelujah, we got it. Let's go to war. Before they get ready to go to war, Jehoshaphat bows his face to the Lord in the temple and they all enter into a posture of worship that causes the Lord to reveal a battle strategy. Now, here's the thing. It would have been one thing for, Je uh, for Jehaziel to give Jehoshaphat this word and Jehoshaphat run to put everybody in the, in the uh, alignment for war. Instead, he gets the word from the Lord and then he returns back to the posture that gives the victory. He turns around and it goes right back in worship. He begins to do a thing and he begins to do it in a way that causes the Lord to be revealed strong and mighty in what they're doing and what they're becoming. Why am I saying all this? When you worship, even when you get the answer, God will get strategy. He'll give feet to the assignment that he's created you for. He'll begin to give you a level of insight that is necessary to walk out what he's about to do in you and what he's about to do through you. And I don't want you to leave a moment without heaven's insight. I don't want you to walk into your next without a revelation of what God is about to do. I want you to have heaven's hand and heaven's insight on how you're going to make it happen. When Jehoshaphat gets the word, he doesn't just run to go to war. He begins to bound down and worship God. He gives God God's glory for what's about to transpire before he even sees it happen. That's how he can get to the place of war against their enemies. And when he gets there, the thing that he dictates or that he sends to happen is not for the warriors to go first, but for the worshipers. Because when you worship God, he'll show you how priorities have to shift if you're going to see his hand and his victory and everything that you're doing. Here's what I want you to get. In being a worshiping warrior, God will change you from being a warrior who worships to being a worshiping warrior. He will shift the alignment and the focus of what he's calling you to be. The reason why they got victory was because before they went to fight, Jehoshaphat said, I don't want the warriors to go first as they typically do. I want the singers to go before the warriors. I want worship to precede the war that we're about to go into. And something happens when you posture your heart for there to be a shift in how you do things. Something happens when you turn from being a warrior who worships and become a worshiping warrior. Because when worship goes first, worship has the way of clearing the battlefield to keep you from having to fight against a thing the way that you would have had to fight if you tried to do it with your hands first. God wants to make you a worshiping warrior. He wants to teach you what it really means to let your worship go before you and to watch what happens when Nisi goes in your place, where your hands don't have to do a thing that it doesn't have the capacity to do anyway. He wants to show you the power of Jehovah Nisi, the fact that the Lord is the banner that walks before you. He is the strength that goes before you. He wants to show you the strength and power of Jehovah Gabor, the the Lord who wars for you. He wants you to see that he is the God that fights for you. The God that in worship will give you a revelation that your hands don't have to touch a thing. If your words touch him in worship, his angels will find it for you. He has a way in worship of confusing everything that would have brought confusion into your life. He has a way of putting back on your adversary 
what they intended for you. Your enemy trying to confuse you, but worship confuses him. Your enemy trying to kill you, but worship will kill it. Your enemy trying to put you in a place where they didn't know, where you didn't know what your next step was, but you letting worship go before your war has a way of confusing your enemy and bringing them to a place where they don't know what their next step is. I am telling you, something happens when you stop trying to fight it first and you start to worship him first. Something happens when you reposition your heart to say, my hands are not going to touch a thing until I have worshiped the God that's going to change it for my good. And if you can get yourself positioned, if you can get the posture of your heart to say, God, I want to see your glory. So I ain't going to try to fight it in my flesh. I am not going to allow my flesh to regulate a moment that I know heaven is calling a new insight perception to come into my life in my hands for. I'm telling you, if your life is at a crossroad, you are at a frustration, you need an answer, you need some insight, you need some strength, you need some power. I'm telling you, the way for you to get it now is in your worship. And if you begin to worship God, watch, in the beauty of his holiness, what I'm saying is, if you begin to worship God just for who he is, and not even necessarily for what you want, something happens in the isness of God becoming a reality in your life that gives you an insight on how you're going to take your next step. I'm telling you in prayer and in worship, God is about to give you a strategy that's going to set up the next 10 years of your life. He's going to give you a revelation that's going to demand to be released in the earth now that's going to give you a strength to go after a thing in a way you would have never done it before. I want you to receive this word that in worship, God is going to to teach you how to war in a new way. And the enemies you have had to try to fight in your own power and in your own strength, you're never going to have to fight that way again. I'm telling you the stuff in your bloodline that you've tried to fight in your wisdom and in your strength, the demons that you've tried to deal with by saying you know the right answer, by, by doing it just a different way, the way that you have just tried to deny yourself a thing, but you have not got delivered from it. Denial is not deliverance. And the Lord says in worship, the deliverer is coming to your life and he's going to teach you how to abandon a thing. He's going to take a taste out of your mouth. He's going to give you an insight that you need in worship that's going to teach you how to war in a different way. Y'all hear me. This morning, God wants to turn your attention and your affection back towards him in such a way that, the, that it causes you to see his hand and his heart in a way you ain't never had it before. And I I do not want us to settle for simply saying, I know God. I'm telling you in worship, God is about to teach us what it means to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and being conformed to his image. He's about to show you a sign of him that you have not seen before, a strength that your destiny demands, and he's going to give you an insight and a wisdom in the season that causes you to walk upright, to walk righteously and to walk with the strength of God. I'm telling you, if you submit to worshiping now, God is about to change your appetite. He's going to give you a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. He's going to teach you the power of seeking his face. He's going to teach you the revelation that comes by wanting to know him better. He's about to give you a thing in a way that you've never had it before. He's about to change the posture of your heart even towards your enemies. He's going to give you the ability to see your enemies from a different perspective. He's going to give you the ability to see the things and the people that have tried to frustrate your destiny from a, a perspective that you've never seen it from before. I'm telling you right now that if you submit your heart to worship, God is going to teach you how to war in a new way. He's going to teach you what it means to go after him, to seek his face and to seek his hand and to see heaven's response to the need and the demand of this season for your life life. So this morning, my prayer for you is that your worry will not usurp your worship. 
important that you will not be so frustrated about a thing and in a season that your heart can't be resubmitted to God to say, God, I'm going to worship you in the midst of it. I declare over you that what you see is not going to block who you know, that you are not going to change your heart or your mind about God based on what you see in a moment and based on the worry that the enemy is trying to fill your heart with. I declare over you that the seed of worry, the ability for you to worry about a thing unnecessarily, the ability for you to be frustrated over a thing in a season that God is trying to keep your mind focused on who he is. A worship is about to eliminate your worry and it doesn't mean you're going to get all the answers. It's just going to be an elimination of your worry. God is about to silence the things that have worried you the most so you can return to your posture of worship. I declare that a lack does not mean that heaven ain't got it for you. So I declare over you that what you're missing in this moment and what you're missing in this season is not going to stop you from seeking the hand of the face of God. I declare that in worship, God is going to open you up to what heaven's provision looks like. That lack is not heaven's issue. And I declare as you align your heart in worship, God is going to give you a way to war against the lack that you feel like you're facing in this season. For some, it's emotional lack. For some, it's a financial lack. For some, it's a spiritual lack. For some, it's a physical lack. Whatever your lack looks like, I declare over you. Worship is about to reveal heaven's provision and heaven's necessity to fill that void in your life. I declare over you this morning that you will never war again as men do. You will not be overly consumed with the way that you fight. God's going to teach you how to fight his way. He's going to teach you heaven's strategy. He's going to give you a revelation for how to fight according to heaven's heaven's will for your life. I declare you're not going to plead for a thing to stay that God is trying to eliminate because it's been blocking your worship of him. I declare over you all idol worship has to cease. So God is going to begin to remove the idols. He's going to begin to remove the things that you have set up that have blocked you from seeing him. I declare that every idol, if it's a money idol, if it's a people idol, whatever idol has been blocked locking your eyes from him. God is about to remove a thing. He's about to remove a person. He's about to remove a situation that has caused you from seeing him the way that you need to be. He needs to be seen. I'm praying for the removal of the poles and the altars of Baal so that you can see God the way that he desires to be seen. I am declaring that in the midst of a thing, God will remove it everything that has blocked you from seeing him and the full reality of who he is. And whatever your altar may be, I'm declaring God is breaking your altar in worship. He's going to show you what it is and he's going to show you how to break a thing up so that you can move forward the way that your destiny is requiring you to now. And I'm declaring that you will war with your worship. That God is going to teach you the strength of worshiping him and the beauty of holiness. I pray uh, that the Lord is going to give you a reality and an insight to the next place of your reality so that your worship will always go before you. And I'm praying for you this morning that you will not be frustrated over the Lord's purging. The Lord is going to show you how he removes a thing. He's going to get a thing out of your system. He's going to get a thing out of your appetite. He's going to get a thing out of your psyche. Mm. And I hear the Lord saying that for some of you, the way he's going to do it is to really deliver you from your past. He's going to deliver you from the thing that has hung over your head, that has kept you from walking in your next place of fullness. Just like Jehoshaphat, you have made mistakes that have got you to a place. But I'm telling you now, God is about to remove the cloud from over your head. He's about to cause the cloud to be removed that has hung over your head, that has caused you from walking 
standing in what he's calling you to be and what he's calling you to do. I'm declaring over you the cloud is shifting and where there has been shame, there will be glory. Where there has been embarrassment, there's going to be glory. Where there has been an over focus on your mistakes, the Lord is about to send glory in a new way. He's about to give you glory to remove the stain of the shame and no longer will you see yourself out of the lens of your mistake. You're about to see yourself out of the lens of worship. He's about to give you a new perspective on what your worship looks like. God is calling for the warriors to spring forth. The sons and the daughters that will posture their heart to say, I'm going to worship God and I'm not going to allow my ashes to stop me from seeing God in a beautiful way. God is about to make an exchange with you. He's going to give you beauty for your ashes. He's going to give you the oil of gladness or the oil of joy to, in exchange for the garment of heaviness. He is going to remove from you the heavy thing out of your life that has caused you to miss who he is. He's about to shower you with the spirit of praise. No longer will you wear the garment garment of heaviness, but your worship is about to send the spirit of praise upon you. No longer will you be frustrated with a thing and with the people because of the mistakes you've made, but God is about to give you a new thing. And he's going to do it as you set your heart to seek his face. And I'm declaring over you that God is going to keep returning you to this place until you get it and you walk it out. I'm telling you that if you make this a habit, God is going to give you something and he's going to do it in a way where he transforms everything about your life with his glory, with his power, with his intellect, and with heaven's perception as it pertains to your revelation and to what he's calling you to be and where he's calling you to go and how he's going to make a thing happen in your life. So this morning, God, we love you for what you're doing because you're providing new strength. And in new strength, you give new insight. And with new insight, you pour new revelation. And with new revelation, you give us the ability to walk out a thing in a way we've never seen it walked out before. So we love you for what you're doing and we anticipate everything that's coming will forever be better than what's been. In our weakness, you're strong. And so reveal your strength in worship. Teach us what it means to go after you in a way that we've never done it before. And I love you, God. We love you for teaching us how to be worshiping warriors. It doesn't mean we don't know how to fight, but it means in every situation we don't have to. And so we submit to you that we love the fact that you ain't going to make us fight in everything, but our worship is going to do it for us. In the name of Jesus, the name that's above every single name and the name that gives us strength and power, the name that gives us deliverance, the name that teaches us how to worship, the name that belongs as the center of our attention and as the focal point of everything that we're becoming. We come in the name of Jesus in honor, glory, and thanksgiving giving to say thank you for a revelation on how we fight as we go out of this. We fight with our worship and our worship is going to do a thing in a way that we never could. In Jesus name, amen. Amen. <laughs> if you know that's you, throw some hearts and some hands. I need to see some hands. I need to see some hands. Let me tell you, ah, man, Lord have mercy. Let, let, me, let me tell you, the, the way that God began to deal with me as it pertains to worship. I'm done. I promise you. I'm, gonna, I'm about to shut up. <laughs> I'm about to get y'all out of here. Uh, let, me, let me tell you how God began to reveal a thing to me as it pertains to worship. And this is, this is it. Uh, when my uh, third daughter, which one's my third? Amana. I had to think about which one was my third. I got stirred this morning trying to make myself just settle in, settle down. When um, Amana, about, she was about two years old. Um, when Amana, and Amana is my, uh, she's my cuddle bug. That's what I call her. She She's the one that loves to cuddle. Uh, she wants hugs. She wants kisses. She always wants to be under you. All of my girls are daddy's girls, but Amana, Amana has my heart in a different way. She's literally Fanika's mini-me by looks. 
but uh, she has my heart in a different way uh, because she is a lover. She has a strong sense of, of worship, even as a young girl. She's very inclined. Her heart is more inclined uh, to it. You, you know, all, all of your children have a different thing, and you'll notice they have a different thing about them. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing, but she, she's my worshiper. She draws close to God. But when she was little, God gave me this very clear understanding as it pertained to worship in our lives because Amana was one that always wanted to be picked up. She always wanted to be held. Uh, she always wanted to be close. Um, and because that was her nature, what she would do is when she really, really, really wanted to be with you or be where you were or for me to pick her up, she she would come and just keep tapping me on my leg. She would hit me. And the only thing she would do was just lift her hands up. She would lift both her hands up and she would wait for me to lift my hands down, to put my hands down, to lift her up to where I was. The thing with Amana is that she was always persistent until I did it. She would hit my knee. She would pull on my leg. She would pull on my pants. She would begin to cry until I would respond to those little hands being lifted and her desire for me to lift her up and bring her close to me. And really, that's what worship does for us. Um, worship is really us saying, God, I need to be closer. I lift my hands, not because I want a thing, I just need to be where you are. And I know I've been close but I know you can bring me even closer. And I know that I've been in your presence, but I believe that if you lift me in this, you can draw me even closer to you. That even though I know what it is to be close to God, I know that I can be even closer than where I am right now. And I believe what gives you the power to be a warrior who worships is you understand that you've been close but you can still draw closer, Lord have mercy. I don't care how close you've got. There's always a place where God will call us in even closer. There's a place mm, where God will give us a wisdom and insight and an understanding that you've seen me on this level, but I can still draw you in closer. I can give you an understanding and revelation of who I am that makes you come even closer. And you've got to settle in your heart <laughs> that no matter what is happening in my life, there's a place where I can still come closer to him. And when I'm in coming closer to him, he gives me something that I didn't know I needed. As I draw close to God, he draws closer to me. And as I lift my hands to change my posture, he lifts his hands to bring me up. And I believe that in the fullness of who he is, he has the ability to lift you and to draw you closer and to take you deeper and to show you a depth and a reality that you didn't know you needed. This morning, I'm believing as God teaches you and teaches us how to articulate worship in a different way. He's drawing us closer to him than we've ever been. And in him drawing us closer, he's given us an insight, perception, and revelation about who he is and what he desires. Guys, if you worship, I promise you, you never have to fight your own battles the way that you fought them before. God is going to give you something in a season that you didn't expect that teaches you what it means to go deeper and to go further in him than you've ever been before. So this morning, I'm just praying that you fix your eyes on Jesus, that you make him the object of your day and your attention. And that you don't allow what you feel to keep your eyes off of what you know. Okay.
<sighs> so <laughs> that is my uh, two cents for this morning. It is my uh, thoughts for the day. Free this help somebody this morning and that uh, your attention and your heart will be holy. Turn to the Lord in everything that you do. All right. <laughs> and I believe your worship is about to send an answer that you've been wanting and praying for. He's about to give you an answer and a response that you need. All right. So that's it. I'm done for the day. It's 6.58. I'm telling you all, <laughs> I'm telling you all that God is doing the thing. And I, I cannot express enough how honored I am. Guys, this, this blesses my life. What? Even right now, I have 140 of y'all on here. Uh, it's about to be 7 o'clock. Many of you all have been on here with me since it started. I'm just so honored. I love you all, too. So honored that you all would make a sacrifice every morning to what God is doing in us. All right. What God is uh, making happen. And I'm, I'm just honored. I'm so privileged um, to uh, have you all in here with us and listening and trusting God for what we're about to do. So, guys, I'm, I'm honored um, I'm honored, 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 honored to have you guys in here. So 739, Lord have mercy. Well, as many as God is allowing to totally view this, it is just such an honor to me for you all to be in here early, early, seeking the face of the Lord. All right. So, because I'm not a morning person, I know some of y'all are like me. <laughs> so this is, but this is blessed, it's blessing my life every morning. And I, I promised you all, I'm going to do this until the Lord says stop. I'm going to do it until he says, you know what, we're going to try this a different way. Uh, we're going to keep seeking his face early. And I believe that God is doing something in us individually and what he's preparing for us to create corporately with all nations Atlanta. So again, I thank you all so much, so much, so much for doing this with me and walking it out with us. If you're, and here's the last thing, if you're not a part of our email list, you want to stay up to date with all things that are All Nations Atlanta, go to allnationsatl.org, slide to the bottom of that web page, and enter in your information. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Enter in your name, your information, your email address. It'll automatically put you on our mailing list. We would love for you to subscribe, to be a part, especially if you're in the Atlanta area. Guys, we've had people relocating from all over the country. It is shocking to me, but it's blessing my life. And it just really speaks to God calling us to do a thing that I would have never expected. I would have never thought that our yes would create this type of this type of anything. So I'm still just in awe of the momentum that God has given us and uh, what he's doing in the midst of it. All right. All right, guys, I got to get out of here. I got to go cook breakfast. Now, my, my daughters, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to tell you all this and I got to go. I really got to go. My daughters love the fact that y'all got me up doing this so early in the morning because um, they get a hot breakfast every morning because I'm up early. That means I'm going to go ahead and cook breakfast. All right. I'm up early enough to fix them a hot breakfast before they go to school. So my daughters are the true beneficiaries of what's happening. So they, they honor you all for being a part of this. So, so it ain't nothing fancy. Trust me. It's just enough to be hot and get them ready for the day. All right. So, all right, guys, I will talk to y'all later. They're very smart. <laughs> I'll talk to y'all later. I love you all. And I pray you all have a tremendous, tremendous day in the Lord. Okay. See you all soon.